What's going on, everybody? Happy Valentine's Day. I am back from Coachella Valley, where I got to see a lot of fun MLS preseason action. There was it. It, it is a beautiful landscape with the mountains in the background, um, but even more fun to just be around MLS preseason games and see a lot of people that I bother all the time on WhatsApp, on texts, on calls, and get to you know bother them in person. I'm sure that they weren't thrilled to. Not everybody was probably thrilled to see me, but uh, I had a lot of fun. I'm dumb, and I, and I drove from LAX into Palm Springs. I thought it was two hours. Um, I'm not a California guy, so I, I wasn't aware that the, the two-hour drive was actually going to be four-hour drives. But hey, we made it. You live and learn. Um, no losses, just learning. That's how we do it. Uh, today, I felt like it was a good time to kind of run through some of those Coachella takeaways. Uh, but more importantly, probably, I've got some latest news that I want to go deep into. LA Galaxy signing a new DP. into Miami having a little bit of trouble with, with the salary cap and allocation money with a week to go before they need to submit the roster. Cincinnati signing, NYCFC signing, and much, much more. Let's get after it. All right, we're going to start with the LA Galaxy. I've spoken about him plenty because the Galaxy have been working on this deal for more than a month. But I reported on Tuesday that finally the LA Galaxy are in the final stages to, of a deal to sign Ghanaian international winner, winger Joseph Pansil of Gank. The, D, the deal will be around $9 million US, um, give or take, right? Like, the, it, you know, it's more than 8.5 million euros, depending on where you see the, the conversion rates, right? The deal isn't totally done uh, or finalized, but it's very, very close. The plan, the hope is that he'll be able to travel over the next couple days or, or maybe even today. Who knows? We'll see. I'm, I'm waiting for updates on that. I've spoken about him in previous videos, so I'll try to not repeat myself, but <clears throat> it is worth repeating that if you could create a player type in a lab to put next to Ricky Pooch in this team, it would be somebody like Joseph Panso. He has got phenomenal finishing ability if it holds up from his career best season last year where he had 17 goals and 14 assists in like 36 regular season appearances. He plays winger like somebody like Denny Bowanga. He He's more of an inside forward than a winger, right? And in this team where you have Ricky Pooch, who's a one-man chance creation machine, you need more goal scorers. You need more wide forward types of players. With Diego Fagundes and Gabriel Peck are more ball-to-feet kind of players and creative types like Ricky Pooch, this other DP had to be a dynamic, back-shoulder, goal-dangerous chance creator rather than somebody who's going to come in and get on the ball. That was part of the problem in recent years for the Galaxy. Um, and Atlanta United have been at most fault of this. Like there was a time where Atlanta had Marcelino Moreno and Barco or, or Barco and, and PT Martinez. These are all players who want to do the same thing. They want to get on the ball and they crowd each other's bases. This signing is so important, not just because of how, how good Pansil's numbers look. He's in the prime of his career, but also he fits so well with the pieces in the midfield in this attack. The Galaxy have spent upwards of like 19 or 20 million this offseason just on, on Peck and, and Pencil. This is serious investment. It's a new motto, a new era under Will Koontz in that they wanted in prime type of players. Gabriel Peck's a young DP, but he's entering his prime or getting closer to his prime. He was with the Brazilian U23 national team. That's a really good signing. You know, they, they signed Mickey Yamane, uh, Japan international right back. He's in his prime. He, he won everything when he was in Japan. Um, I got to watch their preseason game. Yamane looked really, really good. The back line looked a little old, though, around him because Maya Yoshida and Martin Castres were the starting center backs. But, you know, I thought they were fine in the minutes I saw before the starters subbed out. Diego Fagundes looked really good. On the depth chart, Diego Fagundes looks like an overqualified backup. Look, he's going to play a ton of games. He can play across, you know, he can play left wings, 10 right wing. I'm certain that Greg Vanny is going to lean on him this year. Um, and maybe he doesn't exactly fit the best 11 right now with, with Panso and Peck coming in. But I think he's going to get a ton of minutes and be really important for this team. I'm very curious to see how the defense holds up. It's very important for the Galaxy to start fast or Greg Vanny will be under pressure. I was interviewing Will Kuntz um, in Coachella while uh, during their game against Austin. And he was pretty direct. And I said, hey, like, is Greg Vanny under pressure? If he starts slow, like, you know, there were some calls for his jobs. Last year was a disappointment. There was a lot of injuries and everything else. And, and uh, Kuntz was like directly like, look, I have a ton of respect for Greg. Like I, I, we have full confidence in him. Everything it, it's everything that you would want to hear. But we'll see how that resolve is tested if they get out of the gate slow. So that's why it was important for the front office to give Greg Vanny everything that he could have at the beginning of the season. Ramon Sosa was a target that that I've spoken about plenty with the Galaxy. There was a lot of bids. There was a lot of talks. Tyeris 
were of the stance, we're not selling him until the summer. And the Galaxy said, okay, cool, there's no deal to be had. We need to sign another DP right now. And that's the urgency the Galaxy have to start the season. Another interesting subplot, uh, roster compliance day comes next week where all teams have to kind of submit to the league what, what the roster is, what the designations are. Inter Miami, from all accounts, a lot of people that I've talked to at other clubs, agents, even some secondary stuff from people at Miami, they need allocation money. They need it pretty bad. Uh, the situation has been described to me by sources at other clubs as dire. And hey, maybe this is them just being jealous of Miami or, or wanting to point out some of their issues. But again, I've heard it from enough people that it, it's absolutely true. One uh, CSO, one high-ranking executive at another team just put it bluntly to me and goes, look, they're screwed. Trust me. From what I've heard, these are the names that are on, on the maybe not necessarily the trading block, but you know, more or less the trading block. Robert Taylor, Gregory, Jean Malta, DeAndre Yedlin, Serhi Kristoff, Coco Jean, all of them are very available, and that is well known around the league, and teams know that Miami needs salary cap relief and allocation money, so they're not exactly getting in bidding wars, right? They traded Chris McVay to DC United. That was just for an international roster slot. Like, that was salary cap relief, and McVay is an inexpensive player. That's somebody who maybe could have got a couple hundred thousand in allocation money, but DC knew... Miami were screwed. Miami need to move players. Like Gregory, I think that if I was a GM of, I don't know, 25 other teams, I'd be trying to figure out how I could get Gregory. If you could get Gregory for like a salary cap dump, which again, Miami don't necessarily want to do, they would rather sell him for a million in allocation money or they'd rather sell him uh, to Brazil for a few million dollars. But all these teams understand the situation that Miami are in and it's tough. They still have their buyout. Coco Jean is somebody who I'd be shocked if he's still on the team come roster compliance day, whether that's a trade transfer, mutual contract termination or a buyout. It's just, he's redundant in this team. He, he's on too high of a cap hit. They don't really need him. And DeAndre Yedlin, I think that they really need him because uh, Tata Martino doesn't see Julian Gressel primarily as a right back. He sees him as a central midfielder, winger, wing back, whatever. And DeAndre Yedlin's a very good player in MLS. But they're at the point where they have to look at every single player who's over like 600,000 and, like, we might need to move him. They didn't want to trade Kamal Miller. That wasn't their idea coming into the offseason. They, they were contacting teams. Hey, these are the players that are available. Let us know who you want. Um, and Portland was like, we don't want any of these guys, but we would love Kamal Miller. Would you be interested in trading him? And they said, no, we're not. And Portland said, cool. Call us in four weeks if, uh, if you still need allocation money. And that's how that deal got done. And it was an important stack of allocation money. But Miami need more. I'm very curious to see what happens over the next week. They desperately need to move. Look, a team like Kansas City, they were in for Kellen Acosta, and he signed with Chicago. Kansas City should be calling about Gregory and seeing if they can get a deal for him, right? John Mota, like, I think he would help a lot of teams in his league. He doesn't make a lot of sense with this Miami roster. Um, so this is a really interesting subplot to watch over the next week. What kind of deals can team get teams get around Miami? What do Miami need to do? How many players need to leave? What can happen? Uh, they're, they're in crunch time here now. I know this is no, no new news necessarily, but I can finally say, uh, per sources, that FC Cincinnati are finalizing a deal to sign Luca Oriano on loan from Vasco da Gama with a purchase option. Uh, the great CL Merlo says that purchase option is around $3 million. I really like this move for Cincinnati. I am saying right now, if their opening day wingbacks, air quote, are Alvaro Barrial and Luca Oriano, I refuse to call them wingbacks. They're, they're, they're both wingers at heart. Uh, Barrial <laughs> was awesome last year. Uh, the club are still working through his future, whether he leaves at some point soon or, at, or in the summer. Um, right now, Luca Oriano will play right wing back, but he's a left-footed player. He's the long-term solution to Barrial at left wing back whenever he does leave. It was surprised that he did not leave in the winter, in the January transfer window. There are still teams that are interested in the summer. The Brazilian transfer window is still open. We'll see kind of what happens with the future of Alvaro Barrial. But for right now, while both are on the squad, Oriano would be the right wing back or, or right midfielder, is how I'd probably call it. Uh, he's a very attacking player. He played in that Velez, uh, Velez Sars field team, Barrial, with um, Thiago Amada as well. He's a, when he plays as a winger, he plays on the right side, so he can cut in on his preferred left foot. Again, when he plays as a wing back or a wide midfielder, and since he's 3-5-2, he'll end up on the left side. Um, this is a really good signing, man. This guy is is electric. He's like fits this system. These are the kind of gambles, these are the luxuries you can afford at air quote wingback when you have Obi Wobodo, Miles Robinson, Matt Miazga 
and Ian Murphy kind of as your defensive your defensive spine. These are players that are, are obviously very, very good, and they can cover ground, they can win the ball. They f- they make the system, they make it available where you can you can get away with playing Varial and Oriano as the wingbacks if you want. Moving forward, whenever Barrial leaves, the club will look to reinvest at right wing back. Um, I've heard that they're still interested in, in maybe another forward, uh, maybe another squad player. Like they're still interested in adding to this roster, from what I've been told. But again, they're up against cap constraints. That's part of the reason why this deal's alone. Plus, it's opportunistic. Um, Oriano hasn't been great; it hasn't really broken into the starting lineup at Vasco da Gama. So Cincinnati were able to do this on a loan. Well done by them. Good business. They are in the market around MLS, around the globe, uh, but again, they have some salary cap constraints, which happens to teams that win trophies or, or come close to trophies. It's really, really hard to keep together a team, even when they sell Brandon Vasquez for $8.5 million to uh, CF Monterey. So that's one to watch. Um, I think this is a really good signing. I'm sure it'll be announced at some point soon, uh, but Cincinnati are finalizing a deal to sign Luca Oriano. NYCFC are finalizing a deal to sign Jovan Mijatovic. I believe that that's done. I don't know. Uh, according to sources, he's put on his Instagram story that he's on his way to New York. So I think that one feels like a pretty much a done deal. The deal is around eight and a half million. Red Star Belgrade, this 18-year-old, highly rated Serbian youth international center forward. It's it's a very big signing. I've heard from uh, several scouts how good this kid is and that they believe he's ready right away to be NYCFC starting center forward. Um, I'm always cautious with teenagers coming to MLS from a new country. You know, you got to give them time to settle in. But this kid is a real talent, man. They were worried a little bit that this deal might have fallen apart at the 11th hour, something with the payment structures, whatever, but that got resolved within a couple of days. There was, I, I will say, there was another MLS team that was looking into it if that deal fell through and, and they were trying to dangle, hey, we could pay you in, in one installment. We don't need, what, like, you know, the payment structure. So um, he's regarded around the league. Uh, NYCFC get him. City Football Group is obviously a, a big plays a big part in this because the player can look and say, oh, if I do well, I can follow Yango Herrera and Tati Cassiano to Girona or, or wherever else in Europe. Um, again, this is a serious signing. Well done by NYCFC. They've already signed Augustin Ojeda. That deal is up to $7 million. So just in those two players, that's like $15 million worth of investment this winter. They've worked much, much quicker and earlier than they did last year. That contributed to their slow start. There was other factors that, that kind of came in. They This is... You know, again, I talked about Vanny before being, I think, on the hot seat if they start slow. I think Nick Cushion will be on the hot seat as well if they start slow. But again, NYCFC, the front office, the scouting department are doing everything they can to give Nick Cushing the best roster, the best roster available from the beginning of the season. So we'll see how that how they kind of get out at the block. Hans Wolf, I think he's going to play centrally, and Santi Rodriguez is going to play on the left, but they can interchange. We'll see what Nick Cushing, Cushing really wants. Um, and yeah, NYCFC are, are again, really spending money. And in the past they've, they've hit at a really high success rate on signings like this. You think of Gabby Pereira, think of Julian Fernandez. I know he's, he's on the team. He's only been here for half a season. That kid looks good, man. Like they've, they've hit really well when when they make these signings. So, um, Jovan Miatovic, I've got nothing but high expectations for NYCFC, this player. All right. A couple Coachella notes, uh, just from what I picked up around the California grounds. Tariq Fasu, in a former Brentford winger and former Orlando City star, Junior Urso, are both on trial at Charlotte FC. The Tariq Fasu news was, was old. That, that was kind of known. It was reported by Top Ben 90, I believe. Uh, a very good blog out of Charlotte. Junior Urso was not. And I was in the stands. I was like, who? I didn't see the lineup. I saw trial list for Charlotte. I was like, that guy looks from. I was like, who the hell is that guy? And I'm like texting sources. I was like, dude, is that Junior Urso? Are you kidding me? Like, so it was cool to see him. He turned 35 in March, but he looked really good, man. Like, he really did. He was a standout for that team. Um, they are adding a defensive midfielder center back named Jabril Gianni from Kane in France. He That should be announced at some point soon. That's another kind of low-key signing. What They still haven't taken their big swings this winter. The most important was getting rid of Camille Uziak on a permanent deal. And the deal, the loan for um, Carol Swiderski opened up a DP spot. I am firmly expecting them to add a young DP attacking midfielder, maybe a creative winger, probably a 10 is what my assumption is. I think that's going to happen over the next month or whatever. And then I think that they're going to save a DP spot for the summer. Again, these are just plans that are fluid. Everything can change. I'm excited to see what they look like early. Dean Smith, I've only heard good things. They've done a lot of good foundational work. When I was watching their preseason game, again, they don't have 
DPs. Enzo, Enzo Capetti was the only DP on the roster. He was in the starting lineup. They had two trialists in, in Fosu and Junior. So they had a 15-year-old in Infasha Vershimis, uh, uh, U.S. Youth International standout at the U-17 World Cup. He looks really good. I kept forgetting that there was a 15-year-old child on the field. But anyway, this is, a, this is a team with a new coach, new players. They looked really well drilled. They looked really cohesive, much more difficult to beat. San Jose had a lot of their starters out. San Jose looked very good as well, I thought. Um, but I was particularly impressed by Charlotte, just given that this is a new coach, a team in transition with new signings that aren't here yet. A couple trialists. They looked really good. Um, again, Dean Smith is looking like a really, really good hire by Charlotte FC. Nimfasha looks like a first-team player. I would go as far as to say that I think he is going to be a first-team player. From what I've heard, the coaching staff view him as a first-team player, not somebody who's going to spend all of his time with, with Crown Legacy and MLS Next Pro. He's going to get plenty of minutes in MLS Next Pro if I had to guess. But I think that, well, I'd be shocked if he doesn't make his debut this year for Charlotte FC. All right, that'll do it for today. That's uh, the latest news I got. I'm sure that there's going to be more coming up because that's the nature of news and teams are crunching here to try to get signings in. The season starts in a week from today. It's crazy, right? I'm going to try to roll out some preview type of content. Shh, content. Gross. How disgusting is that for me to say that out loud like, with a serious face? <laughs> Anyway, I'm going to have some uh, preview type stuff coming over the next week. Uh, let me know what you guys might want. Uh, I'm going to do a power rankings update before the season starts. Um, young players to watch, all that good stuff. See what other news comes. Uh, but yeah, if there's anything specific that I can do for you, you just let me know. Cheers. Happy Valentine's Day.